What's up PHE friends? Welcome to another video. I'm so excited about today's video because in today's video I get to interview Susanna Harris. I came across Susanna on LinkedIn and if you know me then you know I love me some LinkedIn and she was talking about biotech investing and I was just like ding 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 everything just started going. I'm like what is that? I love the biotech world and I'm very entrepreneurial and so the merger of those two things just seemed like crazy crazy to me. So I reached out to her and she kindly agreed to come on this channel to talk about how she got into biotech investing, the skills that she leveraged to get into her role, and also how she used her personal brand all right, you know I talk about this quite a bit, how she used her personal brand to actually land this role. You're gonna absolutely enjoy this interview. Let's get right into the interview. Uh, so Susanna, tell us about your educational background. Absolutely, so I have my bachelor's of science in microbiology from the University of Iowa, and then I went straight into a PhD also in microbiology and immunology at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and I finished that up in March of 2020. How did you come across biotech investing as a profession, like walk us through that whole story. Yeah. So it wasn't, um, I I'd heard about it a little bit, but it was always something people said, oh, you should check out VC, which means venture capital. And when I was looking at what could I do with science communication, where could I use my skills of helping scientists communicate with other audiences, helping scientists get their work out. Usually it was to the public, sometimes writing grants. Um, and people kept saying, you should check out Biotech VC. And I kept saying, I don't have any financial background. I'm not really sure what VC is. I've never worked in industry. And so I don't really know what biotech means. Uh, so no, I don't think that makes sense. But I, right after grad school, took a job as the lead of marketing for a company that writes small business grants for biotech companies. So just like in a laboratory setting that uh, a lab, a PI can apply for federal government grants, turns out that small businesses that are doing this type of research can also apply for federal grants, just meaning that they apply. The country says, you know what, I think that you are going to do some really cool things with this research. I want you to go ahead and do that. We're just going to give you money because of your background, which was absolutely wild to me. Didn't know that happened. There are a lot of other pieces about biotech and biotech startup funding that it, it was just a brand new world. I thought it was fascinating. It was fascinating to see how, just like in academia, the scientists' ability to communicate their story really affected if they were able to be successful. So while I was working in that job, I happened to meet my now boss. His name is Chris Garabedian at Zontogeny. And we just sort of started chatting. It was during a work meeting and he was a bit taken aback about how I was explaining the company as the marketer. And he was like, you really, you understand this company and its purpose and its constituents. What is your background? And we just got we got talking about it. He he knew who I was, as in he went and looked me up afterwards. He found all the stuff I had on social media, all of the videos I'd done, the kind of network I'd curated. And he said, you know, I think we have a really good use for you. And just like before with other people, I said, I, I really appreciated that. That's very kind, flattering of you, but uh, I don't know these things. And he said, that's okay. With the skills you have, you're going to be able to do the job that we want you to do. And you've already shown that you can learn a lot. You can learn an entire field. So you're going to be able to catch up on the whole VC aspect. So I kind of fell into it. It was also a combination of I, I, I was prepared during that time. I had learned a lot about what it looked like to fund a company. And I had learned a little bit of stuff about what biotech and biotech VC really was. I love, I love that story so much because, you know, in it, you highlight the fact that it wasn't the fact that you knew all about biotech investing that actually helped you get into the job, but it was using your skills of, mm -hmm. you know, and, and as, as, as researchers, as scientists, we are taught storytelling, right? Because you have to create, you have to come up with data and you have to tell a story about that data. And so using those skills, and of course, you were in a 
marketing role and combining that he he saw oh she she has potential and i think that's the biggest takeaway from this part of the story that right you don't need to know everything you just need the basic basic skills to get started so thank you so much for that susanna so based on that what were those skills i know you mentioned those some uh, you mentioned a few of those but could you like ex- you know just explain some of those skills that allowed you do you think allowed you to get into biotech investing and which you think will be beneficial to somebody trying to get into this field as well. Absolutely. So um, first I want to just, my role at Zontogeny is that I am the manager of engagement communications. So when, when I tell people I work in biotech VC, I work in biotech venture capital, usually the assumption is, oh, you're the person going out and giving the money. And that's a really big role of, of these groups. But just like with any other company, just like with any lab, there are different roles for different people. So our CEO does not go out and search and do diligence on on investments, meaning that doing diligence, doing that investment process, it's finding people, it's comparing the landscape, it's learning all of the research. He doesn't do that. Our CFO person who does a lot of the business stuff, he doesn't do that. I do some of the deal sourcing, meaning that I am going out and talking to early career researchers and finding people that would be interested in helping support their company. We work with really, really, really early stage companies, usually first time founders, meaning that they have some cool technology, they want to stay with it, they want to build it, and we have the management team and the capital, the money to give to them. But there's a bunch of other people on my team, similar to me, who are not the key people to be doing the investing. And that really ties back to what you're talking about of the specific skill set. A lot of people look at these different roles and say, okay, if I'm going to go to industry, then I need to be really good at bench science. And if I'm going to go to VC, I need to have a finance background. I'm going to go to government. I need to be in political science, whatever. In each of these different areas, yeah, the, the most commonly known person position in these roles, maybe they, they need that, but um, not every role needs it. And in fact, of our small diligence team, multiple people have a PhD or a master's specifically in science. So anyway, all of that to say, the skills that got me into my role were the fact that I had already proven um, I could understand science really, really quickly. I could process it. I could take on sort of what is a side project. And things like that turned out to be useful in, um, I write the press releases for when we invest in a company or when our company has like a big checkpoint, they get the cool data, they're, they got a new contract, they're moving forward in their clinical processes. I have to be able to go in, look at their data, look at their work, look at the entire field and say, okay, knowing what I know about communications, knowing what I know about how a press release should look, which by the way, I learned on the job, I have to be able to compare across everything and figure out how to convey this message in a way that is interesting, but really accurate. Um, There are legal aspects to what we put out. We can't put out something that's inaccurate because if we do so willingly, it's, it's a really big issue. So that's sort of a, a great example of where the communication skills, understanding how to convey a message rather than just the data have come into to practice. And another big piece was really it in investing, it's a lot of who you know, where people need to know your name. If they have a great idea, you need them to come to you. There's no way to keep on top of all the science. And so my really genuine desire to connect with academics, with early career researchers, with people who are doing awesome science, I didn't realize that was a skill. I didn't realize that was something that was valuable until I got into it. And more and more VCs, venture capital shops, and other investing groups are realizing that is such a key component. So it was it was all of these, we, I don't care, people call them soft skills. It was all of these skills that were not bench science, that were not my ability to write a grant, not my ability to do finances. That is what I am really valuable to my company. And there's other people who, who take on different roles. So I would say for people who are thinking about how do I build the skill set? How do I make myself the best person for biotech VC? I would go a little deeper. Um, I would, and I would flip that script. Um, I think a really big kind of corner that PhDs back themselves into. It was something that I did for a long time as well, was to think about what's my job title that I want and how do I um, how do I become that person? Rather than thinking of what skills do I have and what skills do I want to build and what role will allow me to do that? What kind of area do I want to be in? If I want to be 
in investing or entrepreneurship, instead of thinking, how can I be the investor? How can I be the founder? It's, do I like working in a team? Do I like communicating with people? Do I like doing side projects? Do I want to work independently? Maybe do I really want to be able to understand finance, but I don't have that? All of these things can help lead you to the right path, much more so than just going on LinkedIn and saying, all right, my friend is a bench scientist, research scientist at this lab. What do I need to do to have that role? Those are such, you you, you, you know, you like to say, you drop so many knowledge bombs, right? <laughs> so, you know, I love the fact that you said, what skills do I have and what skills do I want to build, right? We, your, edu- your education doesn't come to an end at the end of your master's or your PhD. There's always opportunity for you to grow and innovate and learn new skills, right? I also love the fact that you talked about flipping the script and, and in my mind, I, I see that sort of, it sounds a little woo-woo and not very scientific, but, you know, like your mindset needs to be right. Like you, you have to flip what you've been told your whole academic career, that if you are a microbiologist, then all you can do is microbiology, right? Yeah. You really have to flip that script. And I, I find that that switch, that flipping um, is really what allowed me to venture into what I'm doing right now. And obviously it helped you as well. Yeah. And didn't even, re- and then another point that I loved was the fact that you said you didn't even realize how those important those skills were. And so you were beginning to explore these career paths. And, and that is again, amazing. So I, I love what Susanna said, look deep into yourself and, and really sit down and self-examine and see what skills you have and how that, you know, is going to help the future company. Just love it. Mm-hmm. So um, I know I didn't, this wasn't a question I had planned, but something that you said sort of triggered it. Um, um, you talked about the fact that when you met your now boss, um, he went and then he checked you out online and found these videos and, and all that. And, and to me, that's personal branding. And that's something I talk about quite a bit. So how, how much has personal branding played into your career? And for those people that are nervous to like, Stop putting their, everybody has a personal brand, by the way. You just have to be on LinkedIn or being on us, Twitter or whatever. It's just putting it on the internet. So how has that helped you? And how does somebody get started with one? Yeah, I, I love that you bring that up because it is something that makes people nervous, especially like you're saying with hardcore science, so much of us are are trained to be like, where's the data? Where's the data? And there's actually a ton of data on how much your reputation affects your success. And that can be good, bad, or otherwise, but we all have this really cool opportunity to help shape that, help give people the pieces that will put together the image of us in their mind that we're really trying to go for, that is authentic, that is, I'm a storyteller, not I'm a scientist. Those are those are different things and they're both valid, but I would rather people think, wow, she's really great at science communication versus wow, she's really great at science. If I was going a different path, it would just be what I highlighted that would change that narrative. And like you're saying, everyone has a personal brand. You can think about anyone else's personal brand at any time. You can think of, maybe you think of your advisor, or maybe you think of a friend, or maybe you think of a celebrity. Think of that person and think of two or three words that would describe them. Think about who you would describe them to and what you would what we, you would tell that person if you were like, hey, friend, you should follow this person on Twitter. And they might say, okay, why should I follow this person on Twitter? And you'd say, oh, well, they're really genuine. I think they're funny. And they talk a lot about snowmobiling. That is their brand. Now, whether or not that's what they want their brand to be, that is what they have put out there that causes their audience to to think about that and to send them to certain people. In the professional setting, that's the same way, that when you're looking for opportunities or when you're open to opportunities, there are so many opportunities we don't know that we missed, that we don't know that we got for, for little reasons where people will reach out and say, hey, I saw on your website, you say that you do this. Are you interested? There's no way that they would know that unless I put this thing out there. That's oftentimes how I get opportunities for workshops or for interviews. Or like you were saying, we connected because of LinkedIn because I was talking about something I cared about. And that's really where I ended up with this kind of, I don't know, portfolio or cache of things that I have done that my boss found was that I pursued the things that I wanted to do that felt like I was going to get better at of interviewing scientists on YouTube channel, uh, you know, creating Instagram and Twitter presences, creating this thing called PhD Balance, which is a, a support network for graduate students. All of these things, I didn't necessarily know were going to 
to be important or tie in, um, you really never do. But all of these really work towards helping me figure out what I cared about, helping me figure out your brand, you know. And ultimately, if you do something you love enough and well enough, oftentimes you get to a point where you can get paid for that thing. Absolutely. I totally 100% agree with everything you said. You do end up getting paid for it because apart from, and I I, I recently gave a talk some, uh, at, a, at a university and I was saying this, I'm like, yes, you're going to get job opportunities. But the, the one thing that has, I don't, I guess I'm not too surprised, but has surprised me about building a personal brand. And in, in this part, just in about a year or so is I've been invited to speak um, at universities virtually. I've um, gotten on podcast interviews that I never thought I would get on, right? Like th- these are big podcasts. I don't know. And in the in the past, I had looked at those podcasts and been like, oh my goodness, it would be amazing to be on that. And then out of the blue, they've invited me to be on that podcast or, you know, getting paid for speaking and stuff like that. Like it opens up so many other doors of opportunity that you don't even realize that, oh, wow, like, this is something somebody would actually pay me for. So building a personal brand um, does just so much for you than even just getting a job is, is more than enough, but yeah. just the other things that come with that are amazing. Well, Susanna, this is such a great conversation. Thank you so much. So if people wanted to find you and follow you as you talk about Biotech VC, where would they find you? Sure. So you can find me pretty much across every social media platform at Susanna, S-U-S-A-N-N-A. A, the letter L, Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S. Um, that's Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, all the places. And conveniently, my website is also SusannaLHarris.com. You can also find um, PhD Balance, which I briefly mentioned was a really fun side project that only tangentially relates to all of this, but kind of highlights, I think, the fact that you can have completely separate interests that end up building on each other. Uh, that group is called PhD Balance. It's www.phdbalance.com. 